Hi, and welcome to Crash Course Cryptozoology. Being a cryptozoology YouTube page, I think I can sort of relate to a lot of people who think of cryptozoology in a, well, very cryptic sense, especially when it comes to the online presence of cryptozoology. We're in 2023 now, and a lot of cryptozoology online happens over Facebook, at least in terms of communication, or Instagram, and these very popular platforms. But if you rewound the clock back about 20 years, you'd find that cryptozoology was mainly comprised online of sort of vague stories on forums and ominous, at best, photographs that would have differing backstories depending on which website you were going to. And while this wasn't, of course, really that great for research, it was a very enticing thing. There's a pair of photographs that, for a lot of people, I'm sure, come to mind when they think of this more obscure era of cryptozoology. And they've had a lot of different backstories and been called a lot of different things. But most would probably remember them for popping up when looking up African Saurian cryptids, especially the Mbilu Mbilu Mbilu. The real story behind them has been uncovered, and it's actually perhaps even more enticing and interesting scientifically than some of the vague cryptozoological backstories in those early days of its presence online gave it credit for. So, what photographs are we talking about? These two photographs first appeared online, as far as I was able to find, sometime in March or February of 2008. Although, there's reason to suspect that they were probably online at some point before this. The earliest instance that I found, which again is in March or February of 2008, appeared on the website Siam Fishing, which appears to be a sort of activity-centric forum website. One of the pages on Siam Fishing, though, included a lot of sort of mysterious photographs that had these almost campfire story-esque elements to them, with very brief descriptions that the author of the particular page had given. And picture number 10, at the bottom of this post, was this photograph. Which, to clarify, is one photo in a set of two photos. No name for the subject or the photographer was given, however there was a label put on it, which was, quote, this is a dragon or something. I don't know. But they said that it was a dragon. From here, these two photographs, especially the first one, since it appears to be considered the better of the two photographs, have appeared in probably millions of websites, and have been called a lot of different things in the lens of mystery animals. Everything from a photograph of Mokele Mbembe, which is supposedly a sauropod-esque cryptid from the African Congo, to the Amela Ntuka, the legendary killer of elephants in certain areas of surrounding regions of the Congo, and even the Likuala regions, Mbilu, 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 which is probably one of the more popular labels that it has gotten. Although other ones still exist, such as the Nguma Monene. Essentially, a lot of these sort of prehistoric African cryptid ideas have been placed on this, again with Mbilu, Mbilu, Mbilu being probably the most prevalent in this particular photograph's sphere of influence. So what exactly is Mbilu, Mbilu, Mbilu supposed to be, and why is it seemingly so strongly attached to this Congo or Likuala region dragon photograph? Mbilu 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 is supposedly a name in a Likuwalan dialect of Congolese, which essentially translates to the animal with planks growing out of its back, or the animal with planks on its back. It's been described as an almost saurian reptile-like species that inhabits the Likuwala Lake. Because of the name especially, many people have hypothesized that Mbilu 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 sightings, if credible, 
can be attributed to extant, or in other words, still surviving, populations of Stegosaurus. Of course, looking at the photograph of the Lukawala dragon here, we might be able to say that descriptive similarities exist, but that's essentially really where it ends. We're not looking at something that matches the description per se of semi-aquatic Stegosaurus offshoot. There is still that mystery around it, though, and that's kind of what brought it into this sort of almost Hall of Fame area of cryptozoological photographs. And even with the discovery of the actual story behind the photo, it still gets spread around in recent times as evidence for living dinosaurs in Africa, which is a very popular cryptozoological subject. However, this animal with these ridges or serrations down its back is not a surviving dinosaur of any kind. But whether or not it's its own species is really also a question, and one that cryptozoology, by nature of course, has to ask itself. The Encyclopedia of Cryptozoology is a wonderful wiki-type website that has recently come to popularity, especially for its level of information and its depth of investigation into the cryptids and the cases that it is able to discuss in its pages, and I highly recommend checking it out. This is one of the few sources that has published the actual story behind the photograph, and this story having been given through official sources, although those are sometimes difficult to track down, is confirmable. The following is the real story behind the photo. The photographs were taken by the host of the hit TV show River Monsters, Jeremy Wade, back in 1993, 1994, or 1995. There is some lack of clarity on the exact time frame. What is known is that this animal was seen by Jeremy Wade on at least two occasions while he was in Brazil. In speaking with people who lived near the body of water that these photographs were taken at, Jeremy Wade found that there was a local name for it, which has been said to be the name Oladira, although there is some confliction about this. Considering that Brazil is a mainly Portuguese-speaking country, attempting to translate the phrase Oladira in any sort of broken-down fashion doesn't really give us anything that I can find, at least so far, as someone who does not speak Portuguese. My resources in that department are, of course, limited because of that. Most translations claim that it means saws or sawtooth. I've even seen one translation that says saw back. And while all of these names make sense, it doesn't really appear that Oladira is really the phrase that would fit them. It's possible there's some linguistic misspelling going on here. But either way, this is what most of the internet understands Jeremy Wade was told this animal was called locally. Which of course is interesting because that suggests highly that people, and multiple of them, had a history of observations with this particular animal. On one of his observations of the animal, Jeremy Wade was able to actually observe the head as it came up out of the water while doing one of its breachings of the surface, and saw that it was, in fact, a species he was familiar with, that being the Amazon River Dolphin, or, of course, as is more popularly known, the Pink Dolphin. Amazon River Dolphins are a really fascinating species. They are freshwater cetaceans, freshwater dolphins, who have adapted for these rainforest environments, live in these extremely murky waters, and yet, like, of course, other cetaceans, are some of the most intelligent animals on the planet. Now, a lot of features of the Amazon River dolphins are very striking, especially the areas of their skull that help produce echolocation, the very long, narrow, toothy beaks that they possess, and the sort of hump-like dorsal fin that comes up from their back. What we don't see, of course, are these weird serrated ridges. And Jeremy Wade noticed this as well, which was why, of course, the observations seemed to be significant. Not much is concretely known on what exactly Jeremy believed had happened to this individual to 
make it different than other Amazon River dolphins, although there are some theories floating around that are worth exploring. The two most popular are that some kind of injury, either accidental or purposeful, had occurred, and the injury left this individual scarred and mutilated in ways that produced these shapes on its back. Several sources claim that Jeremy Wade believes that the scarring was actually intentional, perhaps because of the seemingly symmetrical nature of these injuries, which one does not tend to see in things like motorboat accidents. An upcoming warning here, in order to help illustrate the points that we're going to cover about the potential for what happened to Oladira, there are going to be photographs of manatees and dolphins which both have sustained injuries from motorboats, and if that is something that you do not wish to see, I'd of course recommend averting your eyes and waiting perhaps until the visualizations are done. Manatees especially are known for getting into these accidents involving motorboats and the propellers on motorboats, and they can be rather grisly. One thing to take notice of, though, is the spacing between the scars that are formed in these accidents, and that includes on dolphins as well. While some can be wider than others, generally speaking, they don't form these sort of dips between the left intact masses of flesh that we see on the spine of Oladira. A propeller for our motorboat, as it's creating enough force to both propel the boat and to make these scars, is moving so fast that usually there's just much less space and much thinner cuts made on the unfortunate animal. Even if these cuts had been made at a young age on this specimen, and perhaps healed over time to look less like cuts, the width is still a confusing portion, and as of course is the fact that it somehow created a very symmetrical pattern of heightening ridges, not something that one would typically expect to see. It is possible that these were wounds, as Jeremy Wade believed, that were somehow purposefully inflicted, although it is a bit difficult to imagine people catching one of these dolphins, dragging it to the shore, inflicting cuts, and then letting it go. Especially considering that dolphins are certainly no laughing matter when it comes to defending themselves actively. It's almost weird to imagine a scenario where people could do that successfully by hand, no less. While, of course, we don't know the definitive answer, a strange case of either accidental or purposeful mutilation, depending on what exactly happened, of course. It's important to note, obviously, that Jeremy Wade, being the photographer who saw this animal on two occasions, and who has worked with aquatic freshwater animals for a career in his life, is the person saying he believes that these were purposefully inflicted injuries. The other possibility for what makes Oladira different from other Amazon river dolphins is the possibility that this is some kind of genetic feature that Oladira had been born with. Whether that's the result of a mutation or something that was passed down from a parent is, of course, not known because we've never been able to hold Oladira in our hands. We only have the photographs to go off of and Jeremy Wade's testimony. There are some features that suggest that this could be genetic, including the fact that these ridges and these serrations appear to be mostly symmetrical. While mutations don't have to be symmetrical in terms of genetics, features that are passed down through generations for either their neutral or positive effect on the individuals who have those mutations survival, of course, looking at nature, tend to be symmetrical. So there is this theory that perhaps this is a variation of the typical Amazon River dolphin body type that has newly been introduced into the gene pool in the last 40 years or so. And if that were to be the case, we would then have to ask, are there more of Oladira? Which is kind of an interesting question. Most of the time in cryptozoology, when we're talking about a potentially unknown 
type of animal, we are talking about a species, although there is this sort of collective view of cryptozoology that mistakes this for a belief in a singular animal, such as a the idea that there's only one Loch Ness monster, or only one Sasquatch. However, those expectations are somewhat subverted here. We are discussing whether or not this is a lone individual, because that would allow it entry, or allow it no entry, into the realm of cryptozoology. The question essentially being, was this an injury? If not, does that mean that it's genetic? And if it's genetic, has this trait been passed down to more populations of the Amazon River dolphins? And if it has, is that now a subspecies? Are we now looking at the holotype for a new subspecies or species of freshwater dolphin in Brazil? Of course, with just having the photographs and testimony, this is a long shot to say the very least, but it makes for a very interesting case. This is a case that sort of takes you, it takes one around the world. With all of these different ideas floating around for what people have said this photograph refers to, especially with the Congo dragon idea. Coming finally to Brazil, getting this very exciting story from a prominent figure in zoological programming. And what's more, once you're taken there, the mystery still remains, even though it's a different mystery than one may have started out with. As far as can be found on the internet currently, there don't seem to be any other recorded sightings of Oladira or similar Pink River Dolphin specimens. We might not know the answer to that for a very long time. And until then, Oladira will remain a really fascinating part of cryptozoological lore, and hopefully as much light as websites like the Encyclopedia of Cryptozoology have shed upon it, more can be shed upon it in the future. That being said, until next time.